Welcome to the Money and Meaning Show with Jeff Bernier, a show dedicated to helping you gain the confidence and freedom to lead a life of personal significance and help you get your actions and resources in alignment with what matters most. Well, hello and welcome to the Money and Meaning Show. My name is Jeff Bernier and so pleased that you decided to check us out today as we have our periodic conversations about money and meaning. And, uh, you know, this show is all about helping you create clarity about what matters and then helping you put the financial resources and the, uh, the necessary planning in place to go help you pursue your vision of a meaningful life. And today I am really excited about our guest. Um, I've been wanting to have uh, this guest on for quite some time, and, and it just turned out to be a really good season to, to have him, as will become obvious in a few minutes. So let me introduce my special guest today, Apollo Lupescu from Dimensional Fund Advisors. Apollo is a vice president with Dimensional Fund Advisors, one of the nation's premier investment management companies, managing around $700 billion in assets at a, fir- at a firm level. He is a globally recognized speaker and has delivered hundreds of lectures and talks to both investors and investment professionals all over the country and probably around the world. He is considered the secretary of explaining stuff at <laughs> Dimensional. That's his, his, the name they call him. And, and uh, having seen Apollo make many presentations, uh, and you'll, you'll find out why in a moment as well, he takes some complex subject matter and, uh, and really makes it entertaining, but also really useful for, for most of us to understand and, and do something with. Uh, Apollo has been with Dimensional in Santa Monica for over 20 years. Prior to that, he taught at the uh, University of California. He received his PhD in economics and finance from UC Santa Barbara. Apollo also holds a BA in economics from Michigan State University, Go Spartans, uh, where he competed in water polo. Uh, and he's kept the he's probably kept the same haircut as you may notice from, <laughs> from swimming days. But rumor has it that he's still playing water polo. We can hear about that, I guess. Uh, and also is taken up and and do and is a surfer. So Apollo, welcome to the Money and Meaning Show. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And uh, it's it's great fun to talk to you. And uh, and you already brought up some good memories, Michigan State water polo. Uh, it's been a while, and uh, and you know a little plug for that sport. It's uh, it usually comes out of the closet every four years at the Olympics, yeah, exactly, uh, and that's when people get to see uh, water polo. But it is a f- phenomenal sport, you know, for kids and a, and probably less for adults because unless you know how to swim, it's not necessarily the safest to get in the pool. Yeah, you got to tread uh, water for a long, long time. time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And now, then you coached uh, water polo a bit as well. I think it said, is that correct? I did. I did. I coached the uh, the men's and the women's, and uh, uh, we won the Big Ten uh, two years in All a right. row. And then uh, with the women's, uh, we actually you know set up the program, and uh, and it's still vibrant now at Michigan State. So I'm really proud of of, of the you know just just uh, uh, the way that this continued three years, and it's been thirty. It's kind of hard to say, Jeff, but it's been thirty <laughs> plus years. <laughs> it's like when did time fly? <laughs> yeah, don't don't Used blame. To be young. <laughs> yeah, well, and being a West Coast guy and a surfer now, you're 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 probably in a good place for that in Santa. Uh, Santa Monica, but yeah, anyway, not, not a bad place. Yeah. You know, I love to start these shows just personal. I'd love for you just to tell the audience a little bit about yourself. We already talked a little bit about your background, but tell us about yourself and your family and, and sort of how you found yourself at dimensional in the role that you currently have. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned my my family because um, it, you know it has a big part. I mean, it's it's I'm, I'm, it's it's probably the most. I mean, not probably, but for sure, the most important thing in my life. And uh, and you'll hear in a minute. But the family, actually, interestingly enough, had something to do with the fact that I am here uh, working for this company, uh, Dimensional. Uh, and and it really started, uh, you know, by by getting married uh, to an identical twin. <laughs> Turns out that my wife is an identical twin and uh, uh, her sister, uh, they, they obviously they both grew up together incredibly close. And, uh, um, and and when I finished my PhD and I was getting ready to get a job, uh, I ended up having some offers from the East Coast uh, in investment management. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the best thing because uh, my wife just wanted to be closer to her sister and her sister wanted to be closer to my wife. And uh, uh, and being on the different coast wasn't exactly ideal. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out that that my sister-in-law ended up having lunch uh, with an individual 
uh, who um, was, uh, you know, incredibly charismatic uh, and also incredible human being. Um, and my sister-in-law told him that I'm a little disappointed that my sister's going to be all the way in the East Coast because that's where her husband uh, will work. Uh, and the gentleman said, well, what does he do? And my sister-in-law replied, well, he's finished the PhD in investments and, and finance. And the gentleman said, well, it turns out that I actually uh, work in that area in Santa Monica. Uh, so why don't you have him drop me uh, an email with his resume? And I did. And it was a fairly casual uh, email. I didn't right. know the gentleman. But as I started looking into this firm, it blew me away because I used to teach uh, a lot of the papers written by these academics called Fama in French. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and when I started looking into this firm that I wasn't f aware of Dimensional, I realized that all of these academics from day one, they were uh, working to bring these academic concepts to life in, in real investment portfolios. And I was hooked. I was just, I couldn't believe my luck. Uh, because I have a, an introduction to the gentleman and Dimensional is, you know, it's still to this day, the most academically affiliated firm um, in the world. Uh, we Over the years, we've had five different Nobel winners who have worked with Dimensional. Uh, so when the opportunity came, I really met this gentleman and he, he was an incredibly charismatic. Uh, he was a son of a preacher and, and, and he was a preacher himself but not preaching the gospel, but rather preaching a different way to see uh, the investment process. And yeah. I was so enthralled by, by, by him as a person, but also by the mission that he was on uh, and the clarity that he had, that I basically gave away all the opportunities on the East Coast. And without even having an opening at Dimensional, I said, I, yeah. I'm gonna stick around because this In is where I wanna door. be for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it's been 20 plus years and, and I, I'm just incredibly, uh, happy of that moment in time when I made the decision, and uh, and I'm still 20 years later, and just incredibly grateful to be associated with this firm, and uh, excited to uh, to spread myself a little bit <laughs> the gospel. Yeah, very very cool. Well, I've I've got one other sort of life question I want to ask you, but before I do that, since you already started talking a little bit about the academic heft behind Dimensional. In just a couple of minutes, can you sort of give me the four or five major pillars of your investment philosophy or your investment belief system? Yeah. So the the, the first, and I think it's it's crucial that that we believe in free markets, and and we do believe that free markets work pretty much uh, all around us, much much better than than any socialism or anything like that. And free markets basically say you have suppliers. I mean, you have uh, buyers and sellers. And and when you go to that that marketplace, there's a certain clearing price, and that works. We don't see bananas rotting on the shelf because they're too expensive, and we still see them. And they're because otherwise, if they're too cheap, everybody would buy them. So there's you know we do believe in prices driven by free markets, okay. and we believe that that applies to every thing around us. Uh, and, and one of the cornerstone principles at Dimensional is that financial markets also tend to be incredibly competitive and they're free markets. And for every buyer of a stock, there has to be a seller of a stock. And we believe that the price at, at, that we see every day for a particular stock, uh, it tends to be a pretty fair value. It's, it's, it's as good of a price as the price of you know, oil or bananas or, uh, or, or gas or you name it. Um, so, we, so we do believe in, in, in free markets and, and equilibrium prices. And the economic theory behind that, it's called efficient markets which basically means when you have enough competition, you tend to drive prices to a fair value. And that's the starting point. Uh, it's a fundamental pillar uh, because once you believe that, uh, then going out there and saying that this particular stock is too expensive or too cheap uh, doesn't have a lot of meaning because something is worth whatever somebody else is willing to pay for it. I don't care what you believe. That's what the right. markets- the Buyers and sellers coming together, right. Exactly right. So that's a fundamental pillar because once you believe that, then you absolutely are, are, are just in a different universe because then you kind of say, well, the markets work. What can I do beyond that to improve my investment experience? And the second thing that, that, that we believe is that the the uh, uh, the uh, structure of the portfolio, the way that you uh, uh, mix different things in the portfolio, will ultimately drive the results that you get. Okay. And the fundamental trade-off, in a way, in investing is between how much you can grow your money versus the stability of your assets. Uh, and that is typically uh, associated with uh, stocks as being the growth engine, and that's ownership in companies. And we'll come back to that. It's an incredibly important concept. And the second one is lending money. 
through bonds. And bonds are a form of a loan that have a, a contract that specifies a certain interest rate for how long you get the interest rate and at the back end you get your principal back. Right. Uh, but there's more stability in the sense that they don't fluctuate in value. And in fact, if you do want to hold that bond to maturity, particularly from a reputable borrower like the U.S. government, there's a really, really good chance that you're going to get your interest and your principal back. Uh, so there's less uncertainty with bonds. And what we find is that, and we truly believe is that as an investor, the results that you get are primarily driven by the, this mix of uh, stocks and bonds. Uh, and uh, and that is very specific to each individual. There's not one magic uh, uh, mix. Uh, and that should be driven by a financial plan. You okay. should have a financial plan done with an advisor who is sophisticated enough to create a custom uh, uh, a solution for you. And then once you identify your needs, your circumstances, uh, when do you need the money? How much money do you need? Other assets? Then the advisor can customize that allocation to each individual. Right. The third element that we believe is that uh, you want to be smart about the risks that you take in investing. And there's some worth uh, taking, like investing in stocks versus bonds. I think it's it's absolutely a, a worthwhile for the folks who need some growth in their money. But their other risks are not taking. And one of those is being overly concentrated into certain positions, whether it's AI, whether it's energy or whatever it is, uh, we believe that you're better off spreading your bets as widely as you can. So the third pillar of, of Dimensional's uh, uh, belief is that, you know, so we have this idea of markets work and, 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 and efficient markets, the idea that uh, the structure, the mix between assets will ultimately drive the results of your portfolio. The third one is that you want to spread your bets as much as you can, uh, something that is typically referred to as diversification, uh, because diversification is, 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 is fundamental to an investor such that no one particular investment will ever meaningfully impact your wealth. That's that's what we mean by diversification. Right. That's the third pillar. The fourth pillar uh, is that even within stocks, there are differences. So even as the market price are fair, that doesn't mean that every single stock has the same potential for growth. And then uh, once you un understand that, you can look at broad categories to define well, which one has uh, perhaps a higher expected return, a higher potential growth grow over the long run. And in that respect, science has identified different dynamics in the market that, you know, if we had more time, I can go into them. Yep. Uh, but you can certainly talk to Jeff and the team. Yeah. Uh, and the fifth last one, which is hugely important, is that all of this is in absence of any friction. Uh, what I mean by friction is an absence of any cost of taxes. But in reality, what you take home is after cost and after taxes. So the fifth pillar of what we believe is that, uh, that, that, that you absolutely have to pay attention to the costs associated to investing, but also to taxes, transaction costs, everything else that's a friction that can reduce the amount of money that you keep uh, for yourself. Right. Okay. Well, that was, I mean, that was eloquently stated uh, in just a few minutes. Um, and I know we could spend an hour on each one of those uh, subparts, yeah. um, but let's move on. Um, so the question I was going to ask you about more life types about you is, you know, I, I think a lot of life is figuring out what really matters to us. In other words, what is our purpose? And yeah. that's kind of what this show and my book and a lot of the things I've done in my practice is all about is helping people create the financial margin to go do whatever their why is, you know, as Simon yeah. Sinek yeah. once said in a, in a yeah. famous um, YouTube video. Uh, so t what's your purpose? What do you what gets you jazzed about what you do in your work? Well, I think that's such a good question. Um, what really gets me jazzed is that that you probably the 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 one thing that that I really feel good is when I have an event, when I meet with a family or a group of individuals, and at the back end, somebody comes and tells me, thank you, I understand this a little bit better. Uh, and by, because I understand this investment process a little bit better, I'm not as anxious as I used to be. So for me, this, you know, the, the, the big purpose that I have is, is to educate people, is, is to make them 
uh, more aware of, of a subject matter that tends to be very complicated, uh, very intimidating. Uh, and if I can accomplish that by the end of a session to, for them to see, I, I get it. I mean, I, I see this a little bit better. I see it perhaps in a different light than I used to. Uh, and, and, and that helps me mentally uh, go uh, and, and, and become a, a better investor in a way. I think that that to me is the most satisfying part. Yeah, and I also found in the, in the in what you said is so important because uh, it is not ultimately it, it, life is not about how much money can you make. I, I've seen enough people who are so driven by money, and and money is certainly uh, one of the currencies in life, but there are other currencies. I mean, to me, uh, as you said, to have a meaning. Uh, is is a big deal. If you feel good about what you do and you feel like you're impacting positively the the lives of others, I think that's a huge currency. Right. And 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 you know, in right. many ways, I might be willing to trade off some money uh, and make less money in order to have that. And I think a lot of people uh, probably have that. And there's another currency that has to do with balancing work and uh, and and family. I think that's that's a big one. I mean, would you work so much more uh, that 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 you couldn't? Um, spend time with the family, what's the point of the money then? Uh, or would you would you try to invest money to make the most, but you couldn't sleep at night because you're so anxious about it? I don't think that's that's worth it. Uh, so I, I do think there are different currencies in life. And, and, I, and in, in my view, I'm not really, for myself speaking, I'm not trying to maximize my financial assets. I rather try to maximize my well-being. Yeah. And in that respect, it's 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 just it's just you know certainly financially, I don't want to yeah. be uh, in in dire straits. Uh, but I also want to have a work life balance. I want to find meaning in what I do. I want to have a relationship with uh, my community, uh, and it could be with a church, it could be whatever uh, people have in their lives. But I also really think it's important to look at your physical health, because ultimately, who cares about much money you have if you, if your physical health is 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 not good. So so my view on all this, uh, Jim, is much more about Jeff. Is is how do you maximize well being yeah. rather than trying to focus on mas- maximizing money? Because yeah. then you might be trading off things that are not or you know all worthwhile in the end. Yeah, yeah. Mitch Anthony has a term he uses called return on life, that which I think is pretty good. That's not a just, great one. Yeah. Not just return on investment, return on life. Okay. Yeah. Well, I brought I brought you on today really to talk about one particular thing that I want to go deeper on and. I'm sure you may have noticed there is an election coming up uh, in the United (laughs) States. And, you know, investors across the country are anxious about it. I mean, I'm getting questions about it and on both sides of the political spectrum. And, you know, the concerns range from, you know, they're worried about one candidate trying to take over, you know, the government and and be very autocratic. And, you know, others are worried about another candidate, you know, tons of regulations and higher taxes and trying to control it a different way. And, Uh, So I'd I'd really like to get your take on how should investors think about these concerns about markets and investing in light of a really contentious uh, election season. Of course, we've we've been in what seems like an evergreen election season, but how, how should we think about that as an investor in the elections? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's so timely, and I'm so glad you're approaching this because it is uh, on people's minds. And as you said, there is anxiety on both sides. And, and I've had, uh, uh, you know, so many events with folks who are in regions that are much more conservative by and large. I've seen, uh, uh, I've been in liberal areas as well. And so it's kind of all over the place. And I and I see that anxiety everywhere. Uh, and, and I think it even goes a little bit beyond anxiety, uh, uh, Jeff, that I, that, I, that I think it's so interesting because uh, not too long ago, I was at this event and, and somebody from the audience uh, as we start talking about this, uh, told me a statistic that I wasn't aware of that I thought he was quite interesting, which is that in the U.S., uh, one in six families have members who don't talk to each other because of politics. Wow, it's incredible. Yeah. And, and I and I, you know, I've kind of seen it myself. I mean, I have friends who are not talking to each other because they they just uh, uh, they don't want to they don't want to address they don't think it's worth the trouble to get into that. Uh, I was on a, a cruise ship not too long ago, a small one with with a, a nine families, and 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 the first day we all got uh, on board, and 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 the, the person who organized the cruise set everybody down and said there were two rules on this yacht, and this was like in in, in February, this was like a few months ago, 
Two rules. One is that you're not going to whine. You're not going to complain about this is not hot enough, not cold enough. So no whining. And the second rule, no politics. We don't want to talk Beautiful. politics because yeah. uh, it's, it's not the good. And, and we did it. It was an amazing trip. Yeah. But it, it really got me thinking, Jeff, why is it? Uh, and, and I think that, that these anxieties are real to people. And bec- the reason I, I personally believe that, that the, these anxieties exist and we need to address them is because politics and elections, they touch on our deeply held beliefs, our core identity as individuals. And because of that, they tend to trigger some very powerful emotions. There's no doubt in my mind that, that, that these emotions are real to people. And there's also no doubt in my mind that it's perfectly fine to have these emotions. There's nothing wrong with feeling these emotions because, uh, Jeff, that's what makes us human. It's just the question is, uh, uh, how do you act on those emotions? And I think there's a right way to act, which is go vote, get involved in a campaign if you feel like, uh, and that's absolutely legitimate. It's, it's great. I, I think it's phenomenal. I also found that as investors, you want to acknowledge these emotions, but the really successful ones are are, are individuals who can uh, acknowledge these emotions and at the same time disentangle them from investment decisions and make those investment decisions on much more pragmatic basis, such as data, evidence, look at the numbers rather than how they feel. And that's what I want to uh, talk for the rest of the session is not to make anybody feel good or bad about their political views, but much more about if we acknowledge these emotions and they're legitimate, that's fine to have. The question then becomes, can we disentangle them and simply look at numbers to try to make decisions about your money? That's what we're trying to do here. Um, And and, and so often I I keep seeing the same the same thing is that that people are looking ahead uh, uh, and, and they're projecting their emotions in the way they believe the market's going to behave. And Jeff, I don't know if you remember back in the 90s. I mean, you, you're younger than I am, but <laughs> you remember in the 90s, there was a show called X-Files? Mm-hmm. Yep. You remember that? Yeah. And it was Agent yeah. Fox and Agent Mulder. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he used to watch it in college. Uh, and I remember the tagline I just saw recently, which was, do you remember what it was? No. I want to believe. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> and I feel quite often right now because of these emotions, it's almost the tagline is I want to believe. And I'm, what I'm telling you, folks, let's not look at what I want to believe. Let's look at data numbers. Be very pragmatic about elections and your money. Yeah. And let's start, Jeff, with a fundamental premise uh, when we look at, at stocks, uh, because that's a lot of times that, that what people want to look at. When you look at stocks, uh, and in fact, the stock market itself is a term that I don't personally like because anytime people hear stock market is the idea, oh, I can lose money, I can make money, it's a mystery, it's some some sort of a, almost like a gambling casino. And I think we need to reframe that because stocks and stock market are, are, are just a fundamental premise of free markets and this capitalist system. Why? Because to me, buying stocks allows you and I and everybody listening to this podcast to purchase ownership in companies they did not start. Hmm. I did not start Microsoft. I I don't know Bill Gates. Yet when I buy a share of Microsoft, I am entitled to the profits of Microsoft pretty much the same way that Bill Gates is. Not as much for certain, but I'm entitled to the same earnings potential that he is. So I get to part own into Microsoft or Apple or Coca-Cola or McDonald's, you name it. There's so many companies out there and you can partake into their ownership and their success. And because of that, uh, uh, you know, I think, you know, the stock market, which again, I don't like the term, I think more of as, as an ownership mart. It's a place where you buy and sell ownership. This ownership mart is a fundamental premise of our society because it gives us all a stake in capitalism. When these companies do well, so do we, because we own a piece of those. It democratizes a lot of things in the world. Uh, And I think that's uh, that's what I look at as being investing and and, and, and particularly this ownership mark that typically is called stock market. Uh, And in that respect, what's the function of the stock market? Well, there are two functions. One, you want to facilitate people who want to sell to find people who want to buy because you're not buying and selling with the company itself. You're selling and buying from other investors. 
But the second thing is that you want to find a way to figure out how much is the ownership in any one company worth it? How much is own, uh, how much is, is, is ownership worth it? And that's what the market's doing by allowing these buyers and sellers to freely trade, it arrives at a price. And that price is a value of what I think that ownership is worth. Now, what do I base that price on? You know, Jeff, if you're going to buy a coffee shop, let's start small, buy a little coffee shop. And you think, how much should I pay for this coffee shop? Well, the first thing you look at is see how much money does it make it today? Right. Let's just make, let's make a hundred bucks. If, if, if I think it's going to make a hundred bucks for the next 10 years or 20 years, well, at that point, I can figure out that paying, you know, $50,000 might not be a good deal. <laughs> right. But if I pay 500 bucks, yeah, I mean, it might be a good deal. So it allows you to form a valuation. And that valuation is based on what do I expect the company to make? The, the, the fundamental value of any stock of any company uh, that is traded on these ownership marts called stock exchanges, <laughs> uh, that is based on what do I expect the profits and the earnings of that company for years and years to go uh, ahead. So that's what I want to start by, by looking at. It's about ownership in companies. The value of the ownership depends on profits. So the name of the game here is trying to figure out what will the profits be for a company years and years down the road. Yeah. Well, that's important uh, in terms of understanding um, why markets do work, because you're capturing your share of economic growth is just simply you're capturing a share of economic growth by owning these these great businesses. But but again, you know, I'll just a little pushback here. I'm hearing from clients, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty because of elections. And, yep. you know, should they say, look, I, I get what you're saying that markets are you know, a good place for me to park my money, but just not today because we have an election coming and I don't know what the market's going to do. I'd rather wait till the coast is clear or if a candidate X wins, you know, it's going to kill economic growth and my stocks aren't going to be worth as much depending on which side of the aisle you, yep. you fit on. So what would you say about how markets have behaved in the past during election years that might be helpful to investors thinking through, you know, should they sit on the sideline and wait? Should they apply the money? I mean, what, cause that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing people say, look, let's just wait till after the election or maybe we should reduce risk a little bit because, you know, it, it seems, it seems risky now. What, how would you, how would you respond to that? Yeah. And I think it's a very legitimate question. I think we ought to look at this as investors and see, are we better off just kind of pulling back or are we, you know, is this election year adding additional uncertainty to your point? Uh, the conventional wisdom is that markets don't like uncertainty. Elections in general bring more uncertainty. So election years don't seem like the right time to be invested in the market. Uh, so let's start with that question. Uh, what happens in the U.S. stock market during an election? Uh, and uh, there are different ways to measure the U.S. stock market, which is a whole separate discussion. There are different ways in which you can measure the performance of that market, that if you want to call it that way. Uh, there's something called the Dow Jones that has 30 companies, uh, and that's very shallow. 30 companies, it's not a lot of companies. It turns out that a better metric that professionals use is called the S&P 500 or Standard right. & Poor's right. 500. Right. Uh, and this particular measurement right now includes the largest 500 or so uh, companies uh, in the U.S. stock market. Uh, and that starts with Microsoft and Apple and NVIDIA and Google, Amazon, all the companies, all the way down to other companies that might not be as big, but they're still large and world known like Starbucks and so forth. Uh, and we have a way of measuring the market using this metric called the S&P 500 uh, going back to 1926. So it turns out that if you go back all the way to 1926, since we have good data in the market, uh, what you see is that we have had 24 different presidential elections. And in these 24 different presidential elections, uh, we've had, uh, we have a way of looking at how did the market perform during these 24 uh, data points. Uh, and let's start with that just very basic exercise. How did the market do in an election year? And is that a scary place to be for an investor? Well, if you actually uh, take a look at the numbers, what you see is that 20 out of the 24 years that we have data in the elections, the markets actually went up. 
in 20 out of the 24 years, uh, the markets actually went up, uh, which is quite remarkable because what it means is that you've made money in that election year. Your money grew in that particular election year. Uh, and so it, it, the overwhelming, the preponderance of the time in an election year, 20 out of 24 years, the markets went up. Uh, again, it doesn't seem like a super scary uh, thing, but there are four years when the markets did go down. So uh, you did lose money, your account uh, dropped in value. Uh, so it doesn't appear that every single year uh, of an election, the market goes up or down, but rather what it appears is that more often than not, 20 out of 24 years, the markets went up, but there are four years uh, when the market did drop. So the question is, what happened in those four years and what can we learn uh, if we look at those uh, uh, four years? So let's look at them one by one, uh, starting with 1932. So in 1932, we had an election uh, and, and, and one can point to the uncertainty of that election. Yet, if you think about it, 1932, Jeff, was also a year of the Great Depression. Right. Right. So we had the election, but also the Great Depression. What might have mattered more for the market? The Great Depression. Uh, and then yeah. eight years um, later, we once again, we had an election. One of the candidates, Roosevelt, was, uh, you know, same as in 1932. Uh, and that was in 1940. And, and once again, you can point and say, well, perhaps the candidate has something to do with it. Uh, in reality, if you look at it, just a few months before, in 1939, in September, Germans invaded Poland and we're now in World War II. Yeah. Uh, so once again, what might have mattered more? World War II or the election? And then it took 60 years, Jeff, 60 years until the next time we saw a market downturn uh, in an election year, and that was Bush versus Gore. Uh, and if you remember, uh, the one image that stuck in my mind is the gentleman uh, looking through what's called a chat. Which is a little yeah, yeah, looking at the punch, card. Looking at the punch cards. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. Yeah, in Florida, exactly. And then, uh, and one can point to the uncertainty of that election. Uh, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And yet, if you think about it, 2020 was also the beginning of the dot-com bust. That's when you had pets.com and that's when you had all these high-flying uh, tech stocks just come crashing down. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, uh, it's the election of the dot-com bust. And the last one was in 2008. It was uh, uh, President Obama versus uh, McCain. Uh, and and it's, it's recent enough to know that that was the year of the great financial crisis. Right. So I think what's so interesting is if you look at the data, 20 out of the 24 years, uh, the markets go up in an election year. And in the four instances when the markets did go down, there was something seemingly a lot bigger going on in the world and the economy rather than just the election itself. Uh, so I think it's I think that's important because you look at the data, it doesn't scream panic. And in fact, look at the last election, the last election in, 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 in uh, uh, 2020, not only that was contested, not only that it, it just like, you know, the, the, Chaos, we had, yeah. a, you know, the president, like, you know, the, the, we, we had January 6th, we right. had, you know, folks uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 an insurrection of the Capitol. So there was there was a lot going on. And even in 2020, along with the pandemic. We still had a positive year. So yeah. again, when you look at this, it doesn't seem that simply being an election year necessarily is going to lead the markets to go down. And in fact, more often than not, they didn't. And I have no idea what's going to happen this year. Nobody can tell you. It's just that there's no evidence to suggest that you should panic because it's an election year. Yeah. What occurred to me when you showed that data that I think four out of 20, that's not quite 25 percent, but it's close. And that's about yep. the average downturn, about one every four years, you have a negative year in the stock market, even in all years. About one. So it's kind of random, it seemed to me, just hearing that about 25% of the election years had negative results. Well, that's about the same as any. So, so, to, so, the, so the data says that, you know, it's down about as often as it always is, about about 25 percent of the year the yeah calendar year. it's actually a little bit less yeah i mean i think yeah. it's about less less than 20 sure. percent yeah uh yeah. which as you and you're absolutely right it's about 25 percent uh usually over the long run the market goes down so one in four years yeah uh this is about a little less about 20 percent yeah. interesting a little less than 20 percent. so it's actually a better outcome <laughs> on yeah. average the historically than than any other year so yeah really um, helpful yeah, yeah. Something I've been thinking about too, because there's been a lot in the Wall Street Journal lately about policies, and of course the presidents have all these policies that they propose or the candidates propose, and of course 
they don't have near as much control as we think they do <laughs> because there is a Congress that they got to deal with too, um, and a divided Congress potentially. But I was just I was thinking about some of the tax proposals, and then I hear about you know industries like you know yeah. energy might do well if Trump gets in office, yeah. or you know uh, environmental type organizations might profit if. If Harris wins, how should investors act on that kind of information? Should they change their allocation based on the candidate's policies, do you think? Or yep. is this just more noise that doesn't really tell us much about the future? No, it's, it's again, it's a very so legitimate the, so question. It's really good and, cocktail party talk. Yeah, no, it's it's a good legitimate question, and because you know that you got to pay attention to the world. I think investors need to pay attention to proposals in DC. But the question is. To what degree do these policies impact these uh, sectors, these companies that might be impacted by policies coming out of D.C.? Uh, so starting with the tax regime, I think that the tax regime is quite interesting because over the years, uh, taxes have been up or down. And I think a lot of folks, even at the personal level, they look right now and say, well, we're not really like uh, we're paying too much in taxes. And I was curious to look historically to see on, at a personal level uh how uh, is this current rate relative to other periods? And it's quite interesting because, uh, you know, we're a little below 40 percent right now at the federal rate. Uh, and when I looked, I was stunned to see that in the early 50s, the marginal tax rate, which means that if you earn a dollar over two hundred thousand dollars, there was a threshold two hundred thousand dollars. If you earn one dollar over uh, two hundred thousand, the, the ninety three cents out of the dollar went to the government. Wow. The marginal yeah. tax rate over 200,000 was 93%. Right. And there's so many changes in other areas of the tax code. But if you think about this, there was a moment in time in the 50s where we said, let's relive the good old days. Maybe not that part, because <laughs> <laughs> there was over 90% tax rate over $200,000 which in today's money might be 2 million, whatever it is, but it's still like that was incredibly high. And yet we come out survive. When companies see their tax rates change, they're not just gonna sit there and say, oh, I need to pay some taxes. They're gonna figure out a way to minimize the tax bill. A lot of companies do something called transfer pricing, where they take some asset, they move it offshore, and they, um, uh, they, they basically license it back in the process paying some income to that entity abroad that, that, that reduces their income in the home country. So in other words, there's an army, army of, of, of these folks who are there to advise companies. But what about looking, as you said, to sectors and so forth? And I think it's good to look at some case studies. And I'll start with the previous administration uh, because that was a very um, a, a visible uh, uh, policy that came in the early days, which is that, that we want to support local manufacturers of steel. And if you remember, that was a big uh, uh, initiative. Let's help the steel manufacturers. And, and there's a company that carries the name of the industry. It's called U.S. Steel. And if you look at the, that, that, that company, and if you look at the, uh, the, the, the share price, the, how much the value of each share of ownership, uh, it, it didn't look very good in the early part of the administration. And then all of a sudden you saw, boy, you know what? Um, there's perhaps uh, some help coming and perhaps tariffs might be uh, uh, imposed on foreign uh, steel. And you see this stock going up and it went up quite significantly, uh, more than double in a few, uh, like less than a year or so, because again, the expectation is that the expectation was at a time that, that perhaps tariffs are coming. The question is, did the tariffs ever come? And the answer is yes, they did come. March of 2018, uh, the administration announces steel tariffs, uh, which are providing U.S. steel with a significant advantage in the marketplace. And you look and say, well, that's a great time for me to buy because now I have the full backing of the U.S. government trying to support this right. industry. And if you're an investor saying, I'm going to jump on that bandwagon, I'm going to just go go for it. Uh, well, you know, what's interesting is that by the end of the administration, by the time that the former president uh, left the White House, um, it, it basically <laughs> lost the majority of its value. Yeah. It went from order $40 a share uh, to about you know uh, less than $15 a share. So the vast majority of the value was gone, despite the fact that there were tariffs in place. So to me, when I look at this, should you have jumped on that bandwagon and say, let's buy, let's buy U.S. steel? Not necessarily, not necessarily, because again, it is about the company itself uh, and how is the company 
doing it. And I've heard, uh, you know, several folks across time, as, as I kind of uh, point out this example, they said, you know, we did some business with uh, U.S. Steel and, and they are not always uh, the, um, you know, they, 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 they weren't impressed with their with their uh, product or the timing, whatever it is. So it, much more the way the company operated rather than, than anything more. else. Yeah. Uh, now, the question is, well, what if you say, OK, well, um, that's the one example. Give me another one. Uh, and I think the one that illustrates this quite well, and it was something that I thought about it recently, uh, actually just the last uh, few days, was thinking that that as the previous administration was trying to look at steel and promote the production of steel, one of the big initiatives for the current administration has been uh, a, a renewable energy. And particularly if you think about a solar panel. Solar panels are a, a, a big, um, you know, way to create this renewable uh, energy future that we all talk about, uh, and we know that that has been sort of the administration's uh, goal is to promote that. So, what happened if you had invested in um, in into these companies? And what I thought is like, well, let's look at a company, uh, and then that was called uh, First Solar. It actually has solar in its uh, uh, name. And and I just went on Yahoo Finance, and anybody can go look at it. And if you look at 2021, in January, the price of that company was roughly around $100 a share. So if you had bought one, you know, a share worth $100, what is it worth today? Well, as I looked, I think it was last night that I looked at it, uh, it was over $200. So over the course of three years, it would have doubled in price, which would kind of, you know, maybe invalidate the argument that that you shouldn't put money into an industry that is not really driven, uh, that is not, that that, 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 that yeah. is promoted by the by the administration. Right. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe that's that's something that I want to take, take a look, a closer look. And then I wanted to see, well, that's one illustration. What's another competitor, for example, for uh, uh, for solar? And that p- company is called um, uh, uh, Sunrun. Okay. Sunrun is a competitor. And what's interesting, Jeff, is that in January of 2021, Sunrun uh, had a price per share roughly about the same $100. So both of these companies started at about 100 bucks in January of 2021 when the current administration came in. Yeah. Uh, and it, what's fascinating is that as of last night, the price of Sunrun is less than $20 a share. Wow. So yeah, you can point to First Solar and say, look how great solar has yeah. done. Or you can point to Sunrun and say, well, it went from 100 to yeah. <laughs> uh, less than 20. It lost you know, yeah. 80% of its value. Uh, so how, how do you reconcile? What's going on here? Again, I encourage you to think about uh, the fact that that this whole stock idea is about the company's potential to earn money. And if you think about the potential to make money, it has to do with some regulation to some degree. But I would argue that any company is uh, it controls its destiny more than than anybody in D.C. Yeah, how they execute. Exactly. Yeah. What products they have, what strategy, how they execute, what competitors do. Right. All of these are much more meaningful. And I think it's a good illustration when you look at First Solar and Sunrun, because both of these are solar panel companies. Both of these started exactly the same price per share. One doubled, one lost 80% of its value. Right. Uh, and, and, and by the way, as I look back at some articles back in the 2021, some uh, investment analysts were pointing out, hey, you should buy Sunrun. Forget about <laughs> First Solar. Really? Yeah. I'm going to do it. Yeah. I mean, so it is interesting. And then what if you look at the fossil fuel, because that's an industry that over the course of this administration really hasn't been promoted as much. Uh, and this is where it gets so interesting, because if you look at uh, uh, Exxon, uh, Exxon went from, you know, about $40 a share uh, to over $110 a share. So <laughs> uh, pretty more than double. So yeah. better even the <laughs> first solar in an industry that's not favored by the administration. Exactly right. right. So, you know, again, this is almost like the same thing that I mentioned, or it's the X file syndrome. I want to believe. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I'm here to tell you folks, if you look at the data, I'm not sure that I, that that would form the base of an investment decision. Yeah. Based on the based on the political whims of the day, I guess. Exactly um, right. You know, a question I do get a lot, though, has to do with um, the size of the government's debt in how one administration might deal with it versus another. Uh, yeah. in, in our in our in the confidence in the rest of the world in our fixed income secure in our bonds, you know, supporting you know buying our bonds which keeps interest rates lower 
which is, right. which is generally thought to be good for the economy and good for, for business. And if the what rest of the world loses confidence in our ability to pay their bills, what does that mean? And are we going to default on the debt? I mean, we've had many instances where we get to the brink on the on the you know the resolutions to extend the government and and um, yeah. any any thoughts on that? If there's is there one political party or candidate or type of yeah. worldview that does better in terms of government debt and confidence in our government bonds? Yeah. So it, it just said uh, you, you've kind of asked really great questions because there are three different um, facets to uh, to this to this idea of the national debt. And, and, and I think you touch on all of them. The, the first one is, is the economics of the debt. Um, and, uh, you know, how much are we paying and, 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 uh, uh is, is this too much? Uh, the second one is around politics and, and, and is any one party, any one candidate better suited to deal with this? And the third one is, uh, how are the markets assessing if these, Bonds, which are the way in which the U.S. government borrows, are really worthwhile and they're sustained. I mean, there's they have a sustainable debt. Uh, how how are the markets assessing, and is that the case? So let me touch quickly on the first one, uh, which has to do with you know how to think about the debt and the economic burden almost that it imposes on all of us. Uh, and and if you uh, uh, Jeff, if you look at um, uh, the the numbers at the beginning of the year, so the end of last year, so let's just say early 2024. Uh, that level of the debt that you're talking about was roughly about $34 trillion with a T. So as a country, we owed $34 trillion. And to put that in context, in the early 90s, uh, well, that number uh, was closer to about $4 trillion. So over the course of the past 30 plus years, we have increased the level of the debt eightfold. So it's a big increase. And what's interesting about the, the national debt is that when the government has to repay a bond, so they're the thousand dollars, for example, so they took out, they, they borrowed a thousand bucks from Jeff and they said, Jeff, I need to pay the thousand bucks. So what they can do is come to me and say, listen, are you willing to give me a thousand bucks? I'll pay you interest for a number of years. And then at the back end, I'll give you the thousand bucks back. And I say, sure. So then they can take my thousand bucks, give it to Jeff and push the debt further and further out. Now, whether it's right or wrong, it's something that the government can do and can get away with it. What I'm interested in is what is the one thing that the government simply cannot get away with? They just simply cannot get away with. And to me, that is paying interest on the debt. So the true burden of the debt, it's not the number itself, but how much does it cost us as a country to pay interest the on services. that debt? Yeah. And, and if you look at 1990s, and the, the Fed actually maintains this website, I'll share with you in a second. Uh, it was about 3.1% of the value of the entire economic activity of the country that went into paying uh, interest on that debt. And that was back in 1990s. Well, today it's 2024. Uh, we owe $34 trillion. Well, how much can it possibly be now? with such a larger amount of debt. Well, it turns out that if you look at the Fed website, which I will share with you uh, in a second, and perhaps you can put in the show notes, uh, what you see is that not, that number at the end of last year was actually 2.4%, 2.4%. It was actually lower than uh, uh, in the early 1990s. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's so fascinating if you think about it. And, and here's the Fed website. Uh, and you can see over time that, that we did peak in 1991, uh, and then, uh, and then it's kept going down and down and down. And even two years, three years ago in 2021, uh, we were basically at one and a half percent, very low burden on a historical level, even though the level of the debt, even three years ago was very high, but then it has been going up. So first of all, uh, you know, why is it that, that, why is it that we have such a, a high level of debt and yet the burden is not even as high as it was in the early nineties? Um, and the first thing to note is that 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 the economy is a lot bigger, that everything went up in value. So the fact that we owe more money, uh, it's not really something that should surprise us. So yes, everything, the economy is so much bigger, the stock market valuations are right. so much bigger. So yeah, that's normal. But the second thing, Jeff, is that over the uh, between the financial crisis and and when uh, the Fed started to fight inflation. Uh, we borrowed a tremendous amount of money. You know, a, a really good chunk of that of that uh, uh, the money that we borrowed was during that time. And what's interesting about the time was the fact that the interest rates were rock bottom, very very low. So the government was able to borrow at incredibly low rates. And as these rates have gone up, 
uh, then you do see that, that the burn increases. Um, and it remains to be seen if the rates stay up, uh, then the government has to pay a lot, then perhaps this is going to be uh, going up. But it's also possible that as rates come down, that percentage might come back down again. Uh, so it remains to be seen. So in other words, what I'm telling you folks is that the burden of the debt is a function of two things. One, is the absolute number, what's the number that we owe? And second, what is the interest that we pay on that? And that's a pretty complicated number, it's not one number. Right. Because the government can borrow for a, a month, can borrow for six months, for a year, for five, yeah. 10, yeah, the 20 the years. Matter. Yeah. All, absolutely, and yeah. all of these rates are different. So the government gets to choose a little bit what interest rates they're on a borrowing. So that's the first question. Uh, the second question is uh, that you asked, what, it's about a political party and whether or not uh, one is better than the other. Uh, so I, again, I looked at some numbers recently just to kind of get a sense of that. And uh, if you look at January of 2024, the level of the debt, as I said, was roughly about 34 trillion. I'm gonna use some rough numbers here. Uh, and I wanted to know when the administration took over in January 21, what was the level of the debt back then? And it turns out that it was roughly about $28 trillion. So during the current administration, we have added roughly about $6 trillion in debt, which means that per year, it's about $2 trillion per year. So that's kind of the the average that we've done over the past um, uh, uh, six year, three years, it's about uh, $2 trillion per year. So how is this different than the previous administration? Well, when the previous administration came in in January of 2017, uh, well, at that point, the level of the debt was roughly about 20 trillion, a little less than 20 trillion. So over the course of the previous administration, uh, we added roughly about 8 trillion out of debt, which per year amounts to about Two trillion per year. <laughs> right. And and if I look at this, I don't see an obvious kind of like, hey, you know, that we had a really good or a really bad administration. Right. It seems like the last two administrations are pretty much exactly the same. Right. No difference. And then if you really want to go back at January 2009, at that point, uh, the, the level of the debt was roughly about $12 uh, trillion uh, when uh, when President Obama was in uh, came in the White House. Okay. Uh, and uh, and then so that's about $8 trillion as well, except that that one was for Longer. eight years. Yeah. Uh, so that would be about $1 trillion on average per year uh, if you want to do some math. So it has increased, but the last two administrations, they have been incredibly consistent yeah. in the way yeah. that, that, that they increased the debt. Uh, and it is kind of interesting also to see that that in the last two administration, the Biden and the Trump, if you add up eight plus six, that's 14. Uh, and uh, uh, and the overall uh, level of the debt is 34. So 14 out of 34 trillion dollars in debt came in the last seven years from these two la last two administrations. And it's a very politically complex issues because the, the debt has to do with two sides, both the spending and the uh, the taxation. And we spend money when the economy was doing great. We cut taxes when the economy was doing great, which is not exactly what you see. And there are some bigger political decisions that I don't want to get into. But what I'm here to tell you is that I don't see an evidence that one particular candidate or one party would be necessarily better or worse for the debt. Yeah. And then the last question is, how are investors assessing this? Yeah, uh, and that's a, yeah. that's a fairly straightforward question because when you look at the um, at, at these bonds, uh, the government cannot force any of us to lend uh, lend the money. We have to voluntarily enter into that transaction. So they have to offer me as an investor an attractive enough interest rate for me to say, yeah, I'm willing to pay you that. If I don't find that interest rate attractive, then I'm not going to give them the money. So not too long ago, uh, the uh, uh, the government could borrow money for ten years at about four point six percent. It's it's quite a bit lower today. It's about three point nine or so, three point eight. So it's lower today. Uh, but at that moment in time, it's just what matters is a snapshot in time. Uh, the government was paying about four point six, and it turns out that Apple also wanted to borrow money. And Apple, at, at, for the ten year bond, they would have loved to pay four point six percent. Except the market said, listen. As big and solid as you are, I don't know that you are as trustworthy as the U.S. government. So Apple had to pay an interest rate on the same 10-year bonds that was higher. It was about 5.2%. And that was a way in which the market was signaling that I trust the government more than I trust Apple. Yeah. 
And then you can go down the line, great American company, Ford, they can borrow money for 10 years, uh, but the interest rate or the yield uh, on those bonds was about 7.8%, uh, quite a bit higher. And they would have loved to pay 5.2 or 4.6, but the market was saying, not so fast. I, I, I will not lend you money if you're going to pay only 5.2. I'm just not going to give you money. So they had to find their rates, the comfort of the market. And then Nordstrom, another great uh, uh, retail store, a 9.5% in interest. And if the market gets a hold of the possibility that that particular borrower might not have the ability to repay, well, it's going to show it. And one example here is Argentina. If you look at Argentina uh, at the same time, it was kind of running into some big financial troubles and they could borrow money as well. But instead of 4.6 as the U.S. government, they had to pay over 30 Three wow. percent for the same ten years yeah. to the uh, for investors to invest in that. So to me, what I would suggest to everybody is not to uh, not, not not to succumb to all these emotions and what people are saying, but really look at the way that investors are literally voting with billions and billions of dollars, and they're voting with their money. And what they're saying is that today, I do believe that the the government uh, has a debt that is uh, more sustainable. Than Apple, that's what the that's what the, yeah. the signal is manifested through the interest rates um, that we see, and that that's what I really want to believe in. Is <laughs> if I want to believe in something, that's the market. Yeah, yeah, the market prices in the risk, and it says the U.S. government is still exactly. safe relative to a lot of other alternatives and and creditworthy, despite the headlines and the politics involved Correct. in 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 all of it. Well, this has been really really interesting and helpful, Apollo. Um, any final sort of themes that we should think about? Is there any, like, as I'm going through, there's a lot of information here about, you know, trusting markets and looking at the businesses, okay. don't look at the noise and the politics around it. And you can't forecast one company versus another based on um, political parties or elections. And, and heck, we have we have a presidential election every four years. We have a congressional election roughly every two yeah. years in the Senate. So, I mean, I mean, in the House. So, I mean, we're constantly in election season. So if we take our eye off of what really matters, I mean, it's really easy to get swayed by all the headlines. But I'd, I'd just ask you to maybe put a bow on this. Is there anything that you would like us to take away as we leave the the conversation around around all this? Yeah, absolutely. And what I want to put a bow on is like, listen, the, the big contest this, this, this fall is the presidential election. And I think that's where a lot of the emotions are tied in. And I want to really... Uh, suggest that people ought to look at numbers. Don't don't be swayed by what you hear about one candidate might do this or that. The question is, how do markets behave when you have different presidents? Uh, and what I want to really put a bow on is by looking at uh, my lifetime, I'm 55, I'm born in 1969, uh, and how the markets did. Uh, because over the my lifetime, the S&P 500 went up on average about roughly about 10%. Uh, and what I think is so fascinating is to look at different presidents and how the market did while they were in the White House uh, to see if there's any pattern uh, that one party or another, or one policy or another is better. And it's fascinating because when I was born, President Nixon was in the White House and the market actually dropped by about 2.9% per year uh, for five and a half years uh, while he was in the White House. This is the average annualized per year. And then his vice president came along at 20 plus percent per year, Jerry Ford. And then for four years, we had President Carter at 11.7%, a little bit above average. Uh, and then we had uh, President Reagan for eight years, 15.8% per year. And if you're listening to this, maybe you want to write these down because it's going to be quite instructive to look back at these numbers. Uh, so it's negative 2.9 for Nixon, 20.2 per Ford, positive, 11.7 uh, positive for Carter, 15.8 for President Reagan, and then George H.W. Bush, uh, four years, 13.9%. Followed by Bill Clinton, President Clinton in the 90s, 17.6 positive. Followed by President George W. Bush, negative 4.4% per year for eight years. Followed by President Obama, 16% positive for eight years on average. And President Trump, uh, less than that at about 15.2% per year. And the reason I want to bring this up is that when I look at these numbers, uh, I really don't see a pattern suggesting that Republicans or Democrats uh, are better or worse for the stock market. It just seems like it's all over the place. There's no distinguishable pattern. 
And in fact, I don't even think that presidents should receive credit or blame because you look at President George W. Bush, negative 4.4% per year. It's easy to say, well, he wasn't a good president for the market, even though he cut taxes to dividends and long-term capital gains, and yet the market dropped. Well, he walked in just as the dot-com was going bust. And, you know, 9-11 happened nine months into his term and he walked off at the very bottom of the financial crisis. Yeah. How much did he have to do with the dot-com bust? Yeah. Nothing. Or not yeah. So to kind of say he wasn't a good president is not fair. On the other hand, President Clinton came in just as Pets.com and Amazon and all the other high-flying tech stocks uh, got started uh, in the early 90s. And then he had a remarkable 17.6% annualized. Yeah. Uh, again, how much did the White House have to do with the Silicon Valley startups? Yeah. Not much. Yeah. Uh, but even policies, you take President Reagan, uh, very, very uh, uh, business-focused uh, tax cuts, and the market responded at 15.8% annualized for eight years. Um, and then you compare with somebody focused on healthcare and social programs like President Obama, and and a lot of anxiety, as you said earlier in the in the broadcast, um, about what if you have a president that's not focused on business, they cannot be good for the markets. Well, Reagan, President Reagan had 15.8 annualized for eight years. Same eight years, two terms for President Obama, uh, came in at 16 percent per right. year. Yeah. which is virtually identical. Yeah. So when people are saying, "Boy, he's not going to be a good president for the market." I'm not sure that that's 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 necessarily what the data suggests. Yeah, I may be misinterpreting this, but it just to me it, again, it, it just tells you how little difference the president makes in the market. Because I think you know, if, if the perfect time to be elected is in the depth of a recession, probably. You know, in market terms, exactly right. You know, just get that's elected. The draw. Yeah, get a, but that's random. You you know you don't exactly. you, you can't know that, and it doesn't. So I, I just. It just what impacts me is, you know, one individual's policies um, because markets correct and markets react to the new reality. And it just seems like it doesn't it doesn't matter much. Now, it's it's and I'm going to come back to this idea of it doesn't matter much. Um, And and, but but first, before I get to that quickly, I should let me phrase that it matters a lot in terms of, you know, social programs and taxes in our life. But in terms of predicting the markets, I don't think it matters much. Yeah. And, and there's like there's a there's a, you know, even more obvious example of that, which is not looking only at the presence, but you look also at the uh, uh, you look at the Congress because Congress also matters. You mentioned that. Uh, and, and to really illustrate this, you look at times, for example, one party had full control. And that's exactly what occurred to me back in 2021 when the uh, Democrats won the two Senate uh, yeah. seats in Georgia. And then right. it became obvious that, that they will control the White House, the Senate and the House at the same time. So I thought that that if it's a mixed government, it's hard to disentangle. It's hard to distinguish. Well, they, they control this, but not the other one. Then you start splitting hairs, and <laughs> I don't have many. Uh, but what if you look at times when one party had full control? And that's what I did back in 2021. I looked historically at times when one party controlled the White House, the Senate, and the House at the same time, single party control in D.C. And the Republicans had it for about 13 years. And on average, a simple average, which is a little bit higher than the annualized, just mathematically, uh, it was about 14.52%. That was the average during the 13 years of the Republican uh, unified government control. And the Democrats also had it, but it wasn't 13 years. What was interesting, it was 34 years, so quite a bit longer. Yeah. Uh, and in these 34 years, and I knew this number is going to come back and people are going to say, well, you're trying to promote one party or another. No, no, no. I just, <laughs> this is what the numbers say. Uh, and in fact, back then we had the PhDs in the research group look and double check the numbers. And it turns out that during the 34 years of the Democratic unified government control, the markets went up by 14 point fifty two percent almost identical it is identical yeah. to the second decimal yeah Jeff I mean that's 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 what it is yeah. in, in other words it's not what people want to believe people want to believe something that's just not the reality uh and and to kind of put a bow to all this it, it What I'm saying is not that elections and politics don't matter. Of course they do. They impact companies. They impact regular. There are so many things that impact. To me, I look at politics and elections as one of the many, many, many variables that impact any one company and the market as a whole by extension. It's just I don't see politics and elections as a primary variable, one that I can point to a result and then I can point to an outcome. 
it's not that. Yeah, it's not actually. It's, there's so many other variables. Right. Uh, and, and the most obvious it occurred to me when I was baking cookies with my daughter, uh, because as I, uh, uh, you know, mix in the flour and the sugar, the butter, the eggs, you mix it all in, you put it in the oven. When the cookies bake and you break it apart, you can't really point and say, aha, I recognize the egg yolk in there. No, you can't. <laughs> it's mixed in with so many other ingredients that it becomes indistinguishable. So to me, politics and elections are pretty much uh, is pretty much the egg yolk in a cookie. <laughs> yeah. And the good news is it's not the garlic in a cookie. It doesn't stink it up uh, bad enough to recognize it. So it's it's not it, it's it, it's indistinguishable from all the other things that impact companies. It's just not a primary variable. And because of that, uh, I think so much of what people uh, uh, think that's going to happen uh, is based on their emotions and their concept of the X-Files that I want to believe. When you look at the data, there's nothing to suggest that you ought to change your investment strategy solely because of politics. Yeah, well, that's a great thing to end on there, Apollo. This has been really helpful and fantastic. I thank you for your wisdom and all the explaining that you do. As the Secretary <laughs> of Explaining Stuff, you've uh, met our mission today, I think. So uh, how can people find out more about you or Dimensional, or how can they follow you if they're interested in your writing or anything you put out? What What's the best way for them to check you out? Uh, well, the best way is to contact you because, um, you know, at Dimensional, like we really believe the advisors are absolutely fundamental to the investment process. So we don't actually engage directly with any investors. We only yep. work with large institutions and uh, certain financial advisors. And, and and Jeff, thank you so much for the trust and the partnership over the years. Right. Uh, so if you are curious, I would I would probably uh, say the best thing is go to dfaus.com. That's just to get some general information about uh, the, the company uh, and this investment uh, ideas. But really, it's all about engaging with an advisor, with Jeff, uh, and, uh, um, and, and then really finding out how you customize this process specifically to your needs. Terrific. Well, thank you, Apollo. This has been fantastic. And thank you all for joining us today. I hope you found some value in today's conversation. I'm sure that you found it useful as I did. And please uh, check out uh, the show at all the major streaming uh, platforms where you get your podcast. Um, get, leave us a comment or give us a, a rating would be really appreciated. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at moneyandmeaning at tandemgrowth.com. And of course, you can check out our corporate website, tandemgrowth.com as well to learn more about our wealth management practice. Uh, if you want to check out my book, it's available at all the other online retailers as well uh, or at jeffbernierauthor.com. Thank you all for spending time with us today and make it a great day. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Money and Meaning Show with Jeff Bernier, a show dedicated to help you gain the confidence and freedom to lead a life of personal significance and help you get your actions and resources in alignment with what matters most. We would love to hear from you. If you have any questions or comments on the show, feel free to reach out to us at moneyandmeaning at tandemgrowth.com or you can find us on the web at www.tandemgrowth.com. Jeff Bernier is the President and Chief Investment Officer at Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. This show is a production of Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC. All information discussed is general in nature, is provided for informational purposes only, and should not be construed as specific financial, legal, or tax advice. Listeners should consult an attorney or tax professional regarding their specific legal or tax situation. Listeners should not rely on the content of this podcast as the basis for any investment decisions. A professional advisor should be consulted and or independent due diligence should be conducted before implementing anything discussed in this show. While information presented is believed to be factual and up-to-date, Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC, does not guarantee its accuracy and it should not be regarded as a complete analysis of the subjects discussed. Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC, does not make any representations or warranties as to the accuracy, timeliness, suitability, completeness, or relevance of any information prepared by any unaffiliated third party, such as guests on the podcast, and takes no responsibility for the same.